So um, I'm Philip Griffiths. I'm the head of School of the Built Environment at Jordanstown, and my colleague, uh, Neil Hewitt, um, who is the head of uh, research in the Centre for Sustainable Technologies. And we've been undertaking work in the area of energy research uh, since about 2001, 2002. A lot of the work sort of revolves around a number of different areas. Um, we're sort of looking at sort of all sorts of different um, things to do with energy in buildings, energy in processes, energy generation. My area primarily is actually energy in buildings, and uh, Neil's is um, process energy and heat pumps. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about a number of uh, different aspects with regard to energy storage and what are some of the implications for us. I'm going to be drawing on some of the research that we've undertaken at the university. We do have quite a bit of a track record of bringing in EU research, those um, dreaded sort of words, Horizon 2020, and we actually have just managed to secure a Horizon 2020 project um, on energy storage. Um, at, I was at the kickoff meeting in Brussels last week, um, and they are very difficult to get hold of compared with FP5, FP7, and whatever's gone before. But we have a good track record, and we have a very good track record of late with regard to large-scale energy storage. I'm going to speak to you uh, about a couple of projects on this list, um, well, three projects in total. Um, the Spire project, which is an interreg project, um, iStute, and also the project there, which is halfway down, which is called Einstein. So why energy storage? Well, you know, so wind turbines and photovoltaics, the bane of planners and local MLAs and local councillors and everything else, and they don't look nice, they make a lot of noise, they're not architecturally very pretty and everything else. Well, I would must admit that, that installation of photovoltaics looks absolutely awful, but I'm not here to talk about planning policy and energy, that's maybe for another day, but these are the two mature technologies. There are the others that are developing, and they will take up, um, but these two will take up the market space for the medium term. What are the policy drivers? Well, on the left-hand side, we can see the uh, national 2020 action plans that had to be developed by all the EU states to comply with um, EU legislation. And on the right, you can see the route map towards 2050 and an 80% reduction in our carbon emissions. And then, so recently, of course, uh, politicians like to throw things in, don't they? So the G7 meeting decided they wanted to decarbonize energy by the end of the century. Fine for them to say. Um, but these are sort of quite ambitious targets. Uh, some people or some countries have made a significant start in them. Others are catching up. I will leave you to work out who is who with regard to that here. But this is an interesting little chart here. This is... Um, this doesn't show capacity. This doesn't show install, installation. This actually shows penetration of the market. And you can see how, actually, within Ireland, it is far and away ahead of the rest of the EU with regard to the penetration of wind energy capacity within the total energy market that's out there. As you can see that there, it's sitting at something about 38% projected by the time we get to um, 2020. Now, that's the total generation capacity. Generation capacity is always significantly higher than the actual demand because demand fluctuates and sometimes we have to take um, generators out of the market for maintenance, etc. And you always want some sort of flexibility. And the old days when, um, specifically myself, who sort of grew up in sort of GB, so we had the Central Electricity Generating Board. We had a system where we had certain power stations such as nuclear that generated base load, then we had coal that came on sort of um, during the daytime, and then we had gas that provide what was called the peaking load and things like that. A very, very different market that we have today um, and different ways of approaching things. So with the rush with regard to sort of developing wind power, you can see that Ireland has a significant amount of actually wind power, and that actually causes us problems, um, problems that um, energy storage can certainly help alleviate. Here's just five days from one month, actual real data with regard to the actual amount of wind power that's been generated. Now, the left-hand um, uh, vertical axis there says wind power output in a percentage. And so that's the percentage of installed wind power. And as you can see there, on some days, we're getting a very good output, roughly around about 80%. Okay? And then on other days, we get in that there and everything else. 
And we know that's Northern Ireland because we can have four seasons in one day, let alone four seasons in one month. So we have this variability. So how do we actually cope with that there, where we have 38% of installed capacity being wind power, and the fact that some days we're nearly 80% of it, some days we're 0% of it, other days we start off at 30%, end up at 80%, and we back down to 30%. We need systems that um, provide some sort of buffer to overcome that variability that happens and everything else. Variability, you see, is not good for electricity. This is a frequency diagram, two days, taken from 2006. And as you can see here, you've got the actual frequency um, for those two days, those different lines. When we generate electricity, we generate electricity and supply electricity at 50 hertz. The system operator sits um, for Northern Ireland and sits in Castle Ray, and their job is to make sure that the system sits at 50 hertz. If it starts to sort of fluctuate too much from that, we start getting problems with all our electrical devices and things. And depending upon demand, that will go up and down. So if demand goes up, the frequency drops. If demand goes down, the frequency rises. If I put in a kettle in cold rain, if I've got a strong enough meter on the system in cork, I should actually register the drop in the frequency as a result of that. That's how sensitive the system is. So how do we cope with it? Well, this man sitting in Castle Ray, he's got a big dial in front of him that tells him what's happening. And as demand goes up, he demands more power stations come on stream and everything else. And he is there trying to make sure that that 50 mark stays the same. For those of you who maybe know or don't know the system, is that um, his biggest guide to what's happening is the Radio Times. Because, so if, you know, we get, you know, especially at the Cup final, um, whether it's European Cup or FA Cup, actually it's one of the biggest switch on of uh, power across the whole country when everybody dashes out to put the kettle on, doing half time, and then comes back again. And that's where in the United Kingdom we use uh, Donorick, which is a big pump storage power station, which can give us uh, something in the region of about 1.5 gigawatts of power in 10 seconds. Um, and that's what energy storage can do for you. The thing about it is that. Wind power and PV power doesn't actually give us the frequency. So the frequency carries the power, but actually so because of the technology, wind and PV do not give us those. And so we need other, we need other technologies on our plant, such as, um, at the moment, coal, oil, or gas-fired power stations to actually provide what's called reactive power that actually sort of, um, pushes the electricity down the cables and things. Now, the thing about it is that as we move more towards using... Uh, wind energy. When we want, when the wind energy is on, let's say cut back here. Let's take that red line there. Okay. So when the wind energy is on in the middle of the day, we want to cut back on power uh, from a Ballylumford or Kilroot or um, Kilkira. If we sort of, um, and then sort of during the start of the day, we want to maybe sort of um, boost the power from them because we've not got the wind power. Okay. So you can understand sort of the fact that we have power now going on and off and everything else. Because this wind power is coming onto the market straight on there and everything else. And so if that's coming on and the way the market's designed, the wind power has to be taken onto the grid, then um, something has to be switched off. And as you can see, that as we've increased the amount of wind power on the grid, the number of times we've had to actually start up and switch off our current electricity plant has significantly risen. And the problem about that is that the actual sort of Starting up and the shutting down of that plant there causes problems for the plants. Technical terms are thermal expansion and creep. Uh, thermal expansion happens as we you know, quickly start up and shut down things. Creep happens over a long period of time. But what this really means is that um, the higher that point is in terms of the cumulative startups, the greater the maintenance costs, the greater the frequency with regard to capital replacement. And that's how, sort of, and they are some of the problems that we have in trying to mix these two together without any sort of way of taking that wind energy, storing it, and using it at other times. This is the UK proposals with regard to where they're going in the top left in terms of energy um, generation in the future. As you can see there, there's very much a move away from conventional sources towards renewables. 
Down the bottom here is a, a, sort of a graph where, which shows the actual total energy demand. At the moment, we reckon about 84% is fixed. We can't do anything with it. But that 16% is a significant because actually that is what's movable demand. And we can do things with that demand in terms of demand side management and things, in terms of actually changing where we do things. And I'm going to show you uh, heat pump demand and how we've used that in terms of moving where demand is um, in a few minutes. And the IMECI have released this report here on energy storage, and you can download that if you go to the IMECI website. A very interesting read that is too. So here's the types of energy storage that we're going to be looking for and everything else. And I've been talking about wind power, and I've been talking about photovoltaics and everything else, and that's electricity. But this is a DETI report. And as you can see here, actually our biggest area is heat. If you think about it, you know, unless you're using storage heaters, you're not using heat to heat your homes. So you're not using electricity to heat your homes unless you're using storage heaters. You're using gas or you're using coal or you're using um, oil. And actually, that's the big conundrum. In our homes, 75% of all the energy that we use, the end energy that we use, is um, heat for heating space and for heating off water. The other 25% is um, your son and daughter's iPad or Xbox and, and your cooking and your lights and the things of this there. But lights are significantly lower in terms of demand compared to where they were 30 years ago, especially with the development of LEDs. So we can't actually forget the heat side of things when looking for energy storage options. So energy storage projects. We have these projects that we've been working on. Spire, um, Einstein, and the iStute project. Let's have a start to looking at them. In fact, Spire finishes this week. Um, it finishes the end of this month. F uh, Spire is funded by the European Regional Development Fund uh, out of the Special Projects Office. Uh, in fact, my colleague can't be here today because Special Projects Office have demanded Spire 2 proposal in today, not Friday. So he apologizes he can't be here, and he's also been sort of at the, the, the ending conference which has been taking place in Belfast this last couple of days. So what is Spire? Well, the idea behind Spire is how do we take different energy storage at different levels? So we work with um, Gay Electric in compressed air of energy storage, and we've been drilling into the salt above Larn, trying to work out is um, the salt a uh, good store for us to be able to put compressed air into and then take that compressed air out of and run a compressed air energy storage system and things. And how does that then work with the market? Now, Plexos is the market modeling tool for the all-island grid, and it's well recognized as a very good tool for um, the modeling, um, so you can do things without actually having to sort of have big pits of kits and everything else and destroy people's electricity. And so we use this tool here, and we, market the, we model the market. Auto producers, um, try to think of a good replication of auto producers. The University of Ulster, oops, sorry, Ulster University, have a wind turbine on our campus in Coleraine, and it generates power for the campus. It actually is designed to generate enough uh, to generate base load power, so we never have to export it. But say we want to put another um, um, wind turbine on that site um, because it has been a profitable exercise for the university. Then, um, but at certain times we want to export that. But maybe the market doesn't want to sort of actually sort of want that exported energy. There's no sort of demand for it and everything else. It's far better for us to keep that energy on site, and so. The idea behind this is that you have small-scale energy storage, community-sized energy storage, or maybe some hospital or campus-sized energy storage that will sort of take that power and keep it on the site so that we can then use it at times when we demand it. And then the domestic scale. Um, that's um, for your house, you know, for your heat, for your electric and everything else. And we've been putting that through and doing quite a bit of market uh, modeling with regard to the size. So what does this mean in terms of the price of electricity? So this is um, what's happening there. This is sort of, uh, these are the, sort of the areas where sort of, of the drilling licenses and things like that. In, and those of you who know this part of East Antrim will know that we have quite a bit of salt beds in that area that stretch actually all the way across to Cheshire. And um, the salt is a very good uh, material in which caverns can be actually carved and um, materials stored in them. They're actually extremely safe and um, sort of uh, well worth investigating. They're already doing this across in Cheshire. And you can see here going down through the salt depths and everything else. This little diagram here of what happens. So what we do is that we use excess electricity and we run um, compressors that compresses air. We put it into the cavern. And then when we want the air 
um, we don't want the electricity, we take the air out the cavern and we put it through um, a turbine and it generates the electricity. The turbines look like um, aircraft engines sitting on the ground. This is the auto producer. So here we have a wind turbine at Dundalk Institute of Technology, who are our partners. This is a redox flow battery. And so it's got lots of, sort of weird sort of, uh, liquids and things like that in there that combine and separate and everything else and store energy. And the other thing that they do in for such a large size, size building is that you know, there's a heat demand. So they're actually taking the uh, energy and, and actually in this case here, they're not storing heat, they're storing cool, they're storing cold um, heat, cold water, and this is actually to run the air conditioning. So they don't need to actually use the electricity to run the air conditioning during the day when the demand is on. They can actually charge this up from the wind turbine and then use that um, to displace um, high, high price electricity. And then this is, the, uh, this is ourselves at the Johnstown campus. These are our test buildings, and as you can see here, the huts with a, um, a um, large store on here and everything else. And here we are storing the actual uh, storing the heat. Um, so we're taking the electricity off the uh, off the grid at night, storing it in this big store here, and then using that to heat the house. The market modelling result shows us this. This is um, the no flexible generation, um, and this is the sort of price we get in at 83.83 uh, megawatt hours um, per so per, uh, euros per megawatt hour. Now, the thing about it was that the UK has just agreed a price, or last year, a price for Hinkley Point Power at something like 90-something pence, uh, sorry, 90-something pounds uh, per megawatt hours, which is substantially sort of above that figure there. So you can see what nuclear power does to your balance sheets. Now, this is business as usual. So this is if we carry on with the current technologies and we um, we've implement uh, current policies and everything else. Um, this is advanced gas um, combined cycle gas turbines. These are turbines that you can switch off and switch on a lot easier than the, con uh, the current systems. These are currently in development. But these are the, mo these are the different scenarios we've modelled, 100, 200, 300 and 400 in terms of storage. As you can see here, that um, even sort of our sort of, uh, 100 megawatt storage is beating the flexible no generation sort of, uh, model that we've got here. And the so, and even beating our business as usual. Our 400 megawatt really allows us to even sort of take us below that sort of advanced technology and everything else. So you can see that we can sort of make substantial savings in terms of actual energy generation by looking at sort of grid-based storage technologies such as compressed air energy storage. By the way, it's a bit like the BBC, there are other technologies out there. Um, but such as um, pump hydro. I do mention that in the paper that you'll find in your pack. The thing about it was that Northern Ireland, we have suffered something called a lack of Z to get pump storage to work, unless we go and sort of tow Snowdonia across to Northern Ireland. Um, because, you know, the, well, the only places we could do it in the mornings and everything else like that there, and I believe a certain sort of politician with the best radio show in the country tried to walk up the mornings the other week. So, you know, we, he'll start complaining and uh, we'll never hear the end of it. But um, we, don't, we can't really build pump storage here in Northern Ireland because of, um, sort of issues with regard to protection of the environment. Now, Einstein, what Einstein does is that what we're doing is we're storing community-sized hot water and from, sort of, um, from uh, renewables. There's a picture in the little sort of, um, thing you've been given, I think. And what we do is we store, so we take... Um, so hot water, we store it from solar collectors, and then we actually run uh, heat pumps with it. Heat pumps normally have what's called a coefficient of performance around about three. For this system here, we are running actually about five, um, f five and a half and everything else. Um, we're taking 30 degree hot water there, and we're producing 70 degree hot water so people can run radiators and things like that there. So this is a community size system, and um, and it's moving towards to the, the thing that we're not so good at here in Northern Ireland, and that's the area of um, uh, district heating. But it's something that we maybe need to consider of, um, in terms of investing in, or certainly making uh, provision for it with regard to planning and um, how we actually design our um, communities and things. Now, I mentioned um, that I showed you a little picture of the houses at uh, Jonestown and our um, heat pump. So what we're doing in there is that this is the heat pump being charged and we're charging it at night. What we're doing is that we're artificially telling the heat pump using a little Raspberry Pi 
Um, so the little Raspberry Pi is sitting on the network and everything else, and it's, it's, getting, a, it's getting a time signal down the, the electricity wire, which is superimposed upon it, and it's saying, right, the electricity price for the next couple of hours is X. And it's going, ooh, I can use that. And so it's taking very cheap electricity at night when there's lots of wind power, very little demand, and it's charging a store. So it charges the store, and then it, it finishes sort of around about 6 o'clock and everything else. That um, store is able to heat that house without switching on for the rest of the day, as you can see here. So there's a big demand at the start, and then it cycles demand from that store, which is okay because it's just turning on or turning off a valve, uh, supplying heat through that to that house until um, sort of nearly sort of 20, to 12, 20 to 10 at night and everything else. So we're taking heat during the night, storing it, and releasing it to the house so sort of doing the daytime and everything else like that there. That's far more efficient, far more effective than any hot water, uh, any ther um, electrical thermal storage system that you can have. But this is the way we need to be going. If we were to take out the coal, we take out the oil, take out the, uh, the gas from our infrastructure, we have to decarbonize, we, we have to electrify heat. To be able to decarbonize heat, we have to electrify it. To be able to do that, we've got to move to things such as heat pump technology. Now, the thing about it is that the work that we do at Ulster is we have developed, working with local firms such as Amazon, who are based across in, um, uh, based across in Cookstown, we've developed um, heat pumps that can actually cope with actually supplying heat on, at 70 degrees centigrade so it can be retrofitted to an existing hot water system in a home. But we need to be able to sort of, um, the only problem about it, as you can see back here, is that they're pretty big. And so our, a lot of our work now at Jordanstown is how do we make them smaller? So we're using things such as phase change materials or thermochemical energy storage and things like that. So we can actually make that a lot smaller than it currently is. Because at the moment, you see that there? If we put that into somebody's house, they've lost their living room. Okay? So we need to be able to sort of move that way. What does that mean in terms of policies? Well, a couple of things. Policy in terms of how we actually uh, regulate and manage our energy market is going to be important. And really for us to maybe benefit from there, we do have to maybe look at um, pricing that's based upon what's available when it's available. With regard to um, district heating and uh, local storage uh, for communities, we have to actually, so when we are planning, make sure that we're leaving space for these things. With regard to sort of heat pumps and everything else, we have to make sure that we have the right building regulations um, to be able to cope with you know, stores that have chemicals in them and everything else, not the traditional water systems. So that's a very brief run through some of the things that we do at Ulster in terms of the energy storage. And I hope uh, through the commentary I've given you, I've given you some of the ideas in terms of the policy um, implications for some of these areas. Thank you.